This is the Queen Line tour and the gigantic RV. So I have a tour at 9 a.m. And this is like my 17th mine that I've seen in my life. Okay, so I'm here at 8.30, so let's see what's going on. This is the gift shop. You can buy some rocks. You can go to the shaft. <laughs> it's like the worst word. It's a couple worst words. Anyway, um, no open toe shoes or high heels permitted. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> and yeah, let's look at the gift shop. You can get lots of rocks. And oh, headlamps. Are we wearing headlamps? I do hope we are. That would be pretty cool. That would be my first mine tour where I'm actually wearing a headlamp. Marked off items. Lamps. Cool. Very pretty. Don't need any of it. It'll just break and fall off in the pan. And then over here is a visitor center, a horse that you can sign, a donkey rather, a video, more rocks and gems and stones, which I know because I took a class in college, uh, photo op, mining museum. Okay, awesome. All right. When we go out to get on this train out here, it weevils and wobbles a little bit. Those old batteries and stuff, you know, they kind of jerk a little bit. So I want everybody to get on a straddle, like you do a motorcycle or a horse, okay? Now, if you drop anything going in, do not bend down and try to pick it up. There's a lot of sharp rocks and there's timber in there. And we don't want you to hit none of that stuff when you bend down. Even if we're stopped, if you drop something, let one of us know, we'll come back and pick it up and bring it to you. Now, first of all, we're going to go in about 150 feet. I'm going to stop. That's the darkest, narrowest part of this mine. I'll give you a little talk there about the Queen Mine itself. We'll be in there probably about five to ten minutes. Then I'm going to ask you if everyone feels comfortable about being in there. If you feel comfortable, okay. If you don't, let us know. We'll bring you back out. You get a full refund. Might be in bitcoins or pesos, but it's <laughs> uh, <laughs> helmet that makes my head look super tall. <laughs> okay, so I got a yellow jacket and I have a helmet and there's a bunch of people. <laughs> so this would be okay. It's a pretty big group. Good. <laughs> getting hooked up with lights. Oh, okay, it's kind of heavy. <laughs> there you right, go. Thank you. Okay. Ready for surgery. <laughs> I got a light. <laughs> Okay, I'm getting on the mine train. We have to straddle this thing, not the most ladylike thing, but there's a lot of people, so that's good. All right, cool. they started teaching underground firefighters here. They would come from all over the state of Arizona and New Mexico to be certified here. That's seven levels in it. We're on level, what you like? Uh, we're on level three, there's two below us and four above. <laughs>
Are you there? We love this. Okay, now, if everyone will get off here on this left-hand side and follow me up these steps. Now, we call this a single jack. What you do is you hit this. Every time you hit it, you turned it a quarter turn. Like that, just like that. You want a nice round hole, because dynamite likes round hole. And it also helped break up that face when you was hitting it, make it into smaller chips where it was easier to get out. Now, once you've got collared in, you would switch over to a regular drill still like this. 12 pound hammer. Now we call this a double jack. The reason why, took two men. One's got to hold this steel, while the other one swings this hammer. And they got really good at it because they knew tomorrow their partner would be swinging this hammer. You mess up the day, it's payback tomorrow. I'd rather be swinging the hammer personally. <laughs> well, you had to switch off every day. So, now it would take them about nine hours to drill six four foot holes. They would load them with dynamite, blast them. Now, the only way they had to get it out of here was wheelbarrows and shovel. They shovel it into a wheelbarrow, then tram it all the way down there where that light is down there. It would be a little ramp. They'd run up on that lamp, ramp, and then dump it into the ore car. That's why it took so long to mine this area. What he did, he was what they called a raised miner. They drove the drifts from one level, 100 feet straight up to the next level. Any questions so far? And zinc was, then you look down on the bottom, you see that orangish red looking color? That's called hematite. The gold is in the hematite. And no, I never got a nugget out of here. <laughs> and if I would, I wouldn't tell you anyway. And a lot more died from silicosis. At that time, they didn't even know what it was, so it wasn't even counted in the men loss type division. Oh, now, this mine closed in 1975, June the 14th. We came to work, it was on a Friday. Got here and they said, your last day was yesterday. Oh. That was our notice. <laughs> so, you said you'll be getting a letter in the mail within the next week and a half to two weeks to explain to you everything that's going on. <coughs> they had a lot of holding. I got a letter in about a week and a half. They transferred me to Marinci, up in the northern part of the state, up to that open pit mine. I drive up there, turn around, and go right back home. At that time, there was a motel, a bowling alley, and a fast food joint. That was it. So I'm not bringing my family here. So I didn't even go up there and go to work. Ended up from working in Casa Grande for two years. Then I left there and I went to the uranium mines over in New Mexico. I worked there exactly three months. I came home from work one night. My wife was sitting in the middle of the floor crying with my pistol beside her. She said, we're moving. <laughs> so we just got here, honey. Right? She said, we're moving. So what happened? She said, well, I went to Piggly Wiggly today and bought groceries, putting the baby in the car. They stole my grocery cart, took off with it. So when mama really serious about stuff, we moved the next day. No problem there, right? Especially for that pistol beside her. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Vietnam War ended. <coughs> the day before it ended, the price of copper was $1.85 a pound. The day afterward, it was 25 cents. Oops. It was costing this company about 53 cents a pound to get it out. Wasn't feasible anymore. So what they did is when they shut these mines down, they turned all the power off down here. Now, on this is the only mine in this whole camp that's not flooded. We were under a different water table. On the other side of the mountain, the water table over there is 400 foot. They were pumping about 15,000 gallons of water a minute out of here. When they turned them pumps off, now all the other 28 mines here are all flooded up to the 400 level. Wow. They'll never come back in here again. Been flooded for 57 years. 
Everything's rotted out, timber's gone, rail's gone, and caved in. It would cost way too much money to even think about opening it back up. Soon as the mines started going here, the town started growing. Now at the heyday here, we had almost 40,000 people living here in Bisbee. We had two, uh, 4,000 miners working in this mine. 2,000 on day shift and 2,000 on swing shift. When we finally closed in 75, there was only 1,200 of us left because there was only three mines left that were still going. All right, we're going back on the train. That was interesting. I always trip over my face at least once a day. <laughs> This right here, you didn't have a water hook up to it. You fire it up, five minutes, this drip would be so dusty, you couldn't see me across from you. Then we went to this here. Now this one here, I have water. Water would come in right here on this port. There's a needle in here that runs all the way down into here that goes into this drill steel. This drill steel is hollow. And on the very end, there's two little holes. <coughs> You turn the water on, it will shoot out that end, hit this here, and it drilled a nice, clean mm. hole, no dust. Only bad thing, this thing weighs 280 pounds. <laughs> You'd have to drill a pinhole in the back, hang a come along on it, put a chain around this, tighten it up, loosen those two bolts, jack it up to the next place where you wanted to drill, tighten those bolts up, bolts up, loosen the come along up, get the chain off, and drill another hole. It was just way too slow. Here you would call the floor. We call that the invert. The ceiling is called the back. The wall were called the ribs. And then wherever you were working was called the face. So this is the face right here. Now this is a typical round we used here in Bisbee. It's called a five hole burn. You would drill one center hole. There are four holes around it. But when you loaded it, you only loaded the center hole. When this went off, it would break a ring out about that big around, seven foot back. Then you go to your relievers. What you're doing here is just making the hole bigger, bigger, bigger. And you always shot your lifters last. It would pick that muck pile up and throw it this way a little bit, made it easier for us to get it out. Now, you take one stick of powder, we had a little powder knife, it was about that long, had a little hook blade on, we kept them real sharp, had a wire handle, wasn't worth nothing for anything else. You put a three inch slit down the side of that powder. You stick the primer in the end, run the fuse back along that primer, stick it in there, tamp it in. While you're doing that, your partner's splitting more powder for you. He gives you six more sticks for each hole. <coughs> tamp them in good. Now you got every one of them loaded with seven sticks of powder. This is how we timed it. You take what they call a spitter board. Spitter board. You start right here with that center hole because you've got to get that hole first before the rest of it will break. You run it out about 16 inches. Then you go to your relievers. Now each one you had out here, you want a half inch shorter. You come in about like that, half inch. Then you go to the next one, you want a half inch. You get all about a half inch shorter. And then you'd put another spitter board on it like this and run it down on it. Now, you had them all on here. You take that little powder knife and you would cut them off smooth, flush. Now, the half inch, the reason we had a half inch, that gave you one second between each blast. Because we always counted. Now, you cut that off. Then you had what they call a spitter. This is a welding rod. But the spitter was about this long a little bit bigger around, and it was made out of magnesium. Ah. And it burned at 1,250 degrees Fahrenheit. You would light that because you always carry dry matches up here in your little matchbox. Light it, then you had this, remember that's cut off flush. You could run it that fast across it. It was so hot, it would light all those fuses at one time. Partner come back and said, Neil, he said, I only heard 20. Me too. We got 25 holes, we got 21 loaded. We want to hear 21 reports. We only heard 20. So that meant we had a miss hole. You always blast the equipment time, you go out to the station, you see that miss hole board right back there on that wall. 
you would write down where you worked on that miss hole board. Like I worked in 139A stove, one miss hole. That way, when your opposite partners came on to go to work, they knew there was still a live round in this space. What they'd do is come in and wet down, start marking out, they'd hit that hard spot. And most of your miss holes were always in this area, like your knee holes here or down on your lifters. And most of it was caused by a sharp rock. Come down and cut that fuse off before the powder had time to burn through the fuse. What they'd do then, they'd find that hole, they take a blowpipe that had water hooked up to it, they wash it out nice and gentle, get that powder and primer out of that thing, and go back to work. Uh, the gift shop this morning, if you looked on the left hand side over there, you seen some square cement blocks over on the side of the mountain. Now, the train would come in above that. That's a timber slide. They'd roll the logs off of that train down here. We had our own sawmill. We cut all our own logs to these mines here. We do it all the time. But you have to set up here on the throne <laughs> while we're doing it. Oh, Come on, Gina. Oh. Now, the company called this a sanitary cart for some reason I don't have any idea why. And I never could figure out why they made it a two holer. All you gotta do is come down here, shut these lids, latch it, push it out to the to the station. They would hoist it up, they'd steam clean it, sanitize it, and bring it back down. But you gotta remember what I said. Old. Oh. Old oh, guys forget. I forget all the time. <laughs> you look at that, is that the one I did last week or is that the one I did last month? <laughs> so you pretty much trained yourself after that cup of coffee in the morning, go at the house. You didn't want to go here.